Hello students and welcome to Air Pollution Part 2. We're going to talk about photochemical smog, lead, and thermal inversions in this lecture. And just to take a look at a few of these pictures, this is California down in the lower right, and this is what my first view of California looked like. I was driving across the country, had never been to Los Angeles, was excited to see it, and there was an overlook where you could look out on the city, and so I pulled over and all I could see was a brown blanket. I could not see any of the city at all, which was quite depressing. This upper right picture is London that has on a smoggy day. And I, I don't know which city this is, but the lower right picture when I was a child in the 70s and even when I learned to drive in the early 80s, you had your choice when you went to gas stations. Uh, instead, like now you often have a choice between leaded and diesel. Um, you used to have a choice between leaded and unleaded and you had to make sure to put the right kind of gas in your car because leaded gasoline could ruin your unleaded car and vice versa. And even though this was banned in the early 70s, until all of the cars that used leaded gasoline were phased out of use in the states, we still had to have those leaded gasoline tanks to, to, um, to be able to have those cars run. And we'll talk more about the leaded gasoline in the lecture. So first, what is photochemical smog? Anytime you see the prefix photo, it means light. So photography um, means that you're taking pictures with light. Photochemical means you are having chemical reactions that are driven by light. So what goes on up in your atmosphere? Again, the atmosphere is like a big chemical soup. And so everything we throw in there, and we throw a lot of things in there, and the earth itself puts a lot of things up there. All of those things can go up in the atmosphere and start reacting with one another. And what happens is, is just like when you heat up a beaker to help speed up your reactions, the sun can speed up and actually cause new reactions to happen in our atmosphere. So in places where you get really sunny days, you're going to get more of these photochemical reactions going on in that photochemical smog. In Seattle, you might have noticed that on a nice sunny day, if, it, if we get sunny weather for a long period of time in the summertime, Seattle can start to get smoggy. And then so photolysis, just another word, use of light energy to create a chemical reaction that the sunlight basically acts, acts as a catalyst. And you can see all of these nasty sounding things, which I don't even want to try to pronounce all of them, the things that can be produced. When you see brown smog, it's one of two things. It's either nitrogen dioxide or it's this chemical soup that we just call photochemical smog. All right? And so again, hotter days usually result in a greater amount of this and it will peak in the afternoon. The other reason in Seattle why we tend to get smog in the summertime is that it, when it's not raining, rain will wash out the pollutants. So we don't wash them away. And often in summertime, we don't get much wind. And so we don't blow the pollutants out of Seattle either. So this is just a picture of some pollution over Asia, um, but we have a lot of our own pollution issues here that it's estimated to cause 700,000 premature deaths per year. And you saw in the last lecture, we had some other statistics just worldwide what air pollution does. All right, and this is New Delhi, India, that they have even worse pollution than Beijing. And I'm gonna show you in the, at the end of lecture part four, what New Delhi looks like now during the coronavirus, that it's, they've had polluted air for so long that it has, some of them have never seen clean air in their lifetime. And so what's going on right now when we stop using all of the devices that put that pollution in the air has been really striking. So one of our photochemical smog things that we need to talk about is something called tropospheric ozone. In the last lecture, I mentioned that ozone in the stratosphere is very beneficial to us. It protects us from UV radiation. And, uh, and so we don't get skin cancers, et cetera, because of that ozone layer in the stratosphere, which we want. Ozone in the troposphere, and we also call that ground level ozone, ozone in the troposphere is very damaging for humans for reasons I'll get in, onto, into in the next slide. And um, that the stuff in the, in the troposphere is caused by humans through a variety of reactions that you can kind of see going on down in this lower picture there, that there's various things that happen, which again, we'll get into more on the next slide. All right, so um, what does go on? We have the nitrogen dioxide that is put out by vehicles and, and like factory plants and also something called VOX, which are volatile organic compounds. And they go up and they react with the sun. And what it does is it breaks apart that nitrogen dioxide, I say, is one example. And when it breaks apart, you get this free oxygen. It's called a free radical. Oxygen all by itself is not a molecule or not an atom that's going to stay that way. Oxygen is highly reactive. And so it's, it's, it's not going to stay as, as that oxygen. So one of the things it can do is react with oxygen gas, which is O2, and make O3. O3 is ozone. And again, it's very damaging if you inhale that. So 
why is it so damaging? It's not a stable molecule. Even up in the stratosphere, we have our ozone layer. It's constantly being produced and then destroyed because it's not nearly as stable as oxygen gas. So what happens is, is if you inhale that, that O3 molecule breaks back apart into the O and the O2. And that free radical, if you've ever heard of free radicals in health classes, free radicals can be very damaging because they're going to react with other things in your lungs and can cause um, you know, a lot of, of respiratory um, just damage. It is considered one of the most damaging things to life. And I have my own ozone stories. Um, this is um, a Miller's picture of just the series of reactions that go on to produce that stratospheric uh, or that, sorry, that trop tropospheric ozone, which is then damaging. All right, so here's my ozone story. I grew up right here, just north of Chicago, just south of the Wisconsin border. And this is just the ozone production during the day. And you can see it kind of peaks at, in the afternoon. So people get in their cars in the morning, they start driving, industry ramps up, the factories open. And by afternoon, you get that ozone built up in the atmosphere. And then it kind of dissipates because again, ozone is very ephemeral. It doesn't last very long. But every once in a while, we would get an ozone warning, which means that the air was really stagnant in Chicago and the ozone had built up to dangerous levels. And they would warn parents not to let their kids out and play. They would say, people should stay indoors, don't exercise, et cetera. And we never paid attention to that when I was a kid because it was the 70s. And we would go outside and run around and play anyway. And by the end of the day, my lungs would hurt. And I think back now to that and think about all, and it was usually on those days when we had the ozone warnings. The air often had a, almost an unusual smell to it when we had those days too. All right, we're not the only country with ozone issues. There's Europe anywhere where you're gonna get a lot of cars, a lot of industry, you're gonna have ozone issues. So what are those VOCs, those volatile organic compounds? When you think organic compounds, think hydrogen and carbon. And there's various types, benzene you learned about in the toxicology unit. There are various natural sources. They're emitted from the leaves of some plants, but basically anthropogenic sources. There's, you know, all, a lot of our industry produces these vox. Vinyl chloride is another one, benzene, TCE, industrial solvents, dry cleaning fluids, plastics, and rubber. And as those plastics and rubber break down, they'll release those vox into the atmosphere. This one over here is just kind of a scary little picture of all the things you might find in a cigarette. I threw, I put this one in here. I could have also put this in a sulfur part of the lecture for part one, but I put it here because gray air smog is actually a combination of sulfur and PM, so the particulate matter. So we can just call that soot. So those two things together can make gray air smog. And so that first picture of London I showed you was an example of gray air smog. What kind of factors affect that? The amount of industry, are you burning coal? Are you making steel? What's your temperature? Remember those hot sunny days that will cause, um, that will cause more photochemical smog happening? Uh, precipitation, also if it's rainy, you're gonna clear that pollution out of the air. Wind, again, you can blow it somewhere else. And then topography, if you have mountains or tall hills surrounding your city, you're gonna have a hard time blowing that pollution somewhere else, even if it is windy, because those mountains will block it. And then another, just another note of a type of pollution that you should think about when, um, when you're using these devices, they're called two cycle engines and they're not regulated like cars are. So they will put out an awful lot of carbon monoxide emissions and things like motorcycles, lawnmowers, personal watercraft, leaf blowers, snowmobiles, chainsaws, all of those put out a lot of emissions that it says that if you take a one hour ride on a personal watercraft, it can equal the emissions from a car in a year. So um, that just, it's, that's, pretty, that's pretty amazing. Um, when I first finally broke down and bought a powered lawnmower, I bought an electric mower, partly for this reason and partly because I just didn't like breathing the fumes that come out the back of a lawnmower. And I wanted to give you one more case study, um, just showing you locally what a coal plant can do. So we're lucky in Washington state, we only have one coal plant in the whole state and it's in Centralia, which is down here. It's on the I-5 corridor between Olympia and Portland. And they were going to build another one, but it got nixed because they passed a law that said you had to, that new plants had to at least be as clean as a natural gas plant. So coal plants just can't meet that standard. So we only have the one coal plant. And I, I'm showing you this because I want to show you what one coal plant does. These are the emissions. And this is from the year 2000. I don't know what it is currently, but I, this is the year that I got the data. If you look at, this is in tons per year, except for the mercury. You have nitrogen, sulfur, carbon dioxide, PM 2.5, which is the super harmful stuff. PM 10, which is also harmful, it's just slightly larger or four times larger than the 2.5. 
volatile organic compounds, acid gases, and then mercury measured in pounds. But out of that one coal plant, we put 382 pounds of mercury into the atmosphere. These are air releases per year. So total air releases, I don't know that adding them up really does a whole lot because they're apples and oranges, but this is a lot of air pollution from a single coal plant. Now imagine that you're on the East Coast and you get a lot more electricity from coal, maybe most of your electricity from coal like we do in some states, you would have a lot of these coal plants. Multiply this then by the number of coal plants and you can find out just how much emissions are going to the air from coal. Um, it's not just air releases too, just, you know, we learned about this in another on the fossil fuels lecture, but um, there's also the toxic coal ash. So this is tons of arsenic, chromium, nickel that come out of this single coal plant in a year. So this is, this was in 1998. So, you know, I know I've been, this is one place where I have no problem showing my bias. We need to get rid of coal plants there. We have other alternatives, even if it's natural gas and other fossil fuel. Um, this is just an insane amount of, of air pollution and, and things like mercury, which will never go away. All right, so get off my soapbox and move on to the next topic, which is lead, which is pretty much a success story when it comes to air pollution. Lead is also an element like mercury, so it will not break down. And we already learned about lead in the toxicology unit, so you know that it causes a lot of neurological damage. But for as far as air emissions, um, it's, it's a success story because we banned it. And, and at this point, we really don't um, have leaded gasoline cars around anymore. Even our very old cars, they've been retrofit, so they no longer have to use leaded gasoline. So the number of children with unsafe levels of lead has dropped from 85% to 2.2. If your parents are like me and they grew up in the 70s, um, if they grew up in an urban area with lots of cars on the road, I grew up in a very small town, so this was not so much the case for me, but if your parents grew up in an urban area in the 70s, or 60s, you know, grandparents, et cetera, they probably inhaled quite a bit of lead and the, the damage from that is, is really unknown. So what are we left with? There's only like a few, I see this one there and I just don't see a whole lot. This is as of July, 2018. There's just not a whole lot of countries that use it anymore. Leaded gasoline, why did we use it in the first place? We actually put the lead in. And the reason was is that we had our car, early car engines just did not run well. The engines were rough and they didn't run smoothly. So the, ed, the lead was put in to make them run smoothly. And that was, how, that was how we got that technology off the ground. Well, now we know how to make car engines that can run smoothly without lead. So we've gotten rid of it. And there's no reason at all to be putting lead in gasoline anymore. So it's still used in a few countries, but pretty much this is one of those, those places where there's, there's no reason for it. It's, we didn't know how bad it was when we first started doing it. And so we don't do it anymore. This is from your book. And again, we already learned about this in another unit. So you probably don't need to check that one out. All right, finally, thermal inversions. Thermal inversions are uh, really interesting to me. Uh, first off, what is a normal situation be before we get to an inversion? I told you in the last lecture that the earth is what heats up the air. So the sun comes in, it heats up earth, earth re-radiates re that warmth, that heat back into the air. So low to the ground, you're gonna have the warmest air. Warm air is less dense than cool air. So what happens is, is that warm, that warm air rises and it will then carry the pollutants with it. So in a normal situation, your air pollutants kind of rise into the sky and then get blown off somewhere else. So what happens during an inversion? And we'll talk about how this happens on the next slide, but what if we have cooler air down at the surface? In that case, that is a stable situation. Cool air is more dense, it's not gonna rise. So it holds, that air stays down at the surface and it holds all those pollutants down with it. And you can see a picture here, we'll go into more on the next slide, what causes thermal inversions. So what are your conditions, ideal conditions? Sunny climate, because that photochemical smog thing. Light winds, so that you're not, you need a little bit of wind, and we'll explain why, but you're not, not enough wind that you're gonna blow it away. Mountains on three sides, and again, why three sides? It's because of the fourth condition, the best way to create a thermal inversion is to have an ocean on the other side. And the reason why is that there's things called sea breezes, those onshore breezes that bring in nice cool air off the ocean. This is why people love living in LA is for those nice sea breezes. The problem is, is that that shoves that cold air underneath the warm air and you get a thermal inversion. You can actually see the layer right here in this picture in LA. This is the cap. So basically this is the cooler air underneath the warmer air and it can't escape. LA is surrounded on three sides by mountains. So LA is like the, the ideal place. It fits all of the four criteria for thermal inversion conditions. 
And this is Kabul. It happens in various other places too, and we'll go into some of those. All right, so but first I want to go back to LA because there's this great article in the Business Insider recently that um, basically showed what LA looked like in the 40s, 50s, 60s, etc. And it was nasty. So as the automobile really took off and the other piece of the story is that uh, cities like Los Angeles and Seattle used to have rail systems that were torn out as the automobile really took over. And that was partly done by the automobile and the tire industry to get people using cars. So LA was just, you know, really bad. People were actually covering their faces, not because of coronavirus, but because the air was so nasty. You can look at this one. It was actually hard to see cars on the road. The air was so thick. And here's someone looking over the city, but you can't even see it. And that's kind of like my first experience when I first saw LA about 30 years ago. All right, some more pictures. Um, this is from the 1940s and they mentioned the ozone issue. Um, this is, you can't even really see very far in that one. And again, people began to notice it, but they just thought, oh, you know, that's the way it is. They didn't realize that there was anything they could really do about it. And again, so more, more than a million cars by 1940, and they ripped out the rail system. So by the early 1950s, they realized that it was car exhaust that was producing the smog. And before then, we actually didn't, we, we, we didn't know just the damage that these that these cars could do and back then we had no emission controls at all on cars and they used the leaded gasoline to, on top of it so the cars contributed to ozone you can see the thermal inversion layer right there and then this is 1954 and again looking out at an upper story window you can barely see the buildings and you can barely see the ground um, people started to get really bad effects from it so they started doing you know things like like wearing their own masks and this, they, this was interesting to me. They were actually bringing in canisters of pure air, fresh air brought in and people would inhale it for a while just to help clear their lungs. And, and it just, people said it burned to breathe. I find this one interesting. I guess she was wearing that helmet uh, because it was also, there were wildfires going on outside of town, um, the Santa, probably from the Santa Ana winds. Um, and this might've helped her with the ash a little bit, but it wouldn't have helped with the smog because um, she, would be inhaling it right where it's coming in through her where her neck is and then again um, looking at again this is kind of reminiscent of my first view of Los Angeles and that's in the 1960s so you know the Clean Air Act, Act passed in 1970 but it took a while before all of those emission standards can change so in California because their air was so bad in Los Angeles they got an exemption an amendment that allowed them to set their own pollution control so they could actually put in harsher pollution controls than the rest of the country. They have had that agreement since 1970. So fast forward almost 50 years, and in the last year, the Trump administration rolled back the cleaner emission standards that the Obama administration had put in for car fuel efficiency standards. And California said, okay, you can do that, but we're gonna go with our amendment that says that we, we're gonna keep to the Obama era standards, and actually car oil companies were okay with that too. The Trump administration said no, and he revoked their ability to set their own air quality standards, going back on 50 years of agreement on, um, on that. So immediately, of course, this has gone to lawsuit. So California and 22 other states have filed a lawsuit in November challenging this change. And California on top of that, I think with also a few other states filed another lawsuit in September, also challenging the Trump administration's move to roll back the emission standards in the first place. So this, this is a story that hasn't been told yet. We, I, you know, the, the court cases tend to take a long time, but it's, it was rather amazing to me that, um, that they would revoke that um, amendment that has allowed California for all these years to set their own standards. And to this day, Los Angeles struggles with smog. So uh, I, I, I'm in favor of them keeping them, of course. All right, so finally, uh, LA is not the only place, but more recently in the last decade or so, Salt Lake City can you see the city? I can't. You can see just barely make out some things down there. Salt Lake City, you think about it, it's in the middle of Utah. It's a beautiful Rocky Mountain state. It's absolutely gorgeous. So why are they getting thermal inversions? They have the same issue with sunny climate, mountains on three sides, and in their case they don't have an ocean that brings in that cooler air, but there's often temperature conditions that create that cooler air underneath the warmer air. I have friends who are astronomy professors in Ogden, Utah, and they complain about they get affected by this thermal inversion too. And the air quality is really poor in Salt Lake City when these go on. And here's another slide of some other areas, other cities that also suffer from thermal inversion. So it can happen anywhere with the right conditions, but certain cities based on that combination of weather and topography are gonna get them more commonly. And just a um, final story to round out this lecture 
1948, there was a thermal inversion disaster. And I told you in the last lecture that people would build really tall stacks to send out their smelting, like the Asarco plant in Tacoma, that they had these really tall stacks. And the idea was you send out all your toxic everything high into the atmosphere, and then the wind carries it off somewhere else and deposits it, say, Mercer Island. Um, but in this case, there was a thermal inversion. And instead of the um, high stack in the, in the air pollutants getting carried off somewhere else, the thermal inversion came through and actually pushed all those all that toxic air down on the ground. 20 people died, 14,000 people got sick. Um, I'm sorry, 6,000 people got sick in town and 20 died from that one event. So you can see that these thermal inversions can be quite devastating for a town's population. All right, so that is the end of lecture part two. And next in lecture part three, we're gonna be looking at acid rain.